Hello and welcome to chapter one as we are getting started in our theater textbook. Um, before I get started on my lecture though, I want to remind you that first you ought to watch this documentary. It's about an hour long. It's on the um, library website. It's a PBS documentary, very high quality. So if you haven't already watched that documentary that we'll be using as a case study today, please go do that first and take the quiz before you begin the um, lecture portion. So that's the book I'll be lecturing from today. We'll just work chronologically by page number. I'll kind of follow along and uh, that's a good way for you to watch the lectures is with your book in hand. Uh, I'd like to start on page three by reading a quote um, that answers the question, what is theater, from the introduction. Theater is, above all, a living art form. It does not simply consist of plays, but also of playing. And a play is not simply a series of acts, but a collectivity of acting. Just as a play and act are both noun and verb, so the theater is both a thing and a happening a result and a process, fluid in time, rich in feeling, and human experience. So part of the reason that I asked you to go watch that documentary is because um, nailing theater down as a definition is sort of, mm, it's uh, like nailing jello to the wall. It's kind of a fluid thing, it's an active thing, it's a thing that's different for every experience that you go to, and uh, it's fluid. It's not simple. If we were to walk into a uh, museum and I showed you a sculpture, that's art. Uh, that is what it is. There it is. If I go look at it today, it'll be there. If you go look at it tomorrow, probably going to be the exact same sculpture. But theater is not that simple. So I'll spend the majority of today's class looking at theater from different angles. So if I were to introduce myself, I might say, hello, my name is Emily Seal. Um, my maiden name is Brown. I'm from Cowan, Tennessee, Emily Brown. Uh, I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a former actress. Now I'm a teacher. I teach theater. I teach speech. So you see all of these different things about me. So we're going to look at theater from different angles as well as I introduce you today. So theater is a building. It's a company of actors. Uh, it's the play itself. Uh, it's the result. It's a rehearsed script. It's an assemblage of actions, sights, sounds, ideas, feelings, uh, but above all, it's people. So as we get started today, just kind of an overview. So hearkening back to the ancient Grecians, and uh, a, lot, a lot of your classes are probably doing that right now because sort of the foundation of the Western world is the, the uh, ancient Grecian uh, civilization, which was very well recorded. I'm sure there was theater in ancient Egypt, and we'll touch on that when we get to theater history, but um, theater in ancient Greece was very well recorded, and the word that we use for theater comes from the Greek word theatron, which means seeing place. Seeing place. That's a um, Greek theater there. Doesn't look very comfortable, uh, does it? But it was more like a football uh, stadium than what many of us think of today. is a very, very huge space um, full of everyone in the town. They would shut down all the businesses for these big festivals. People would go to the Theatron. So turning over to page eight and nine. So the theater building started as that sort of circular, um, well, it actually started, do you see that circle there at the bottom? It actually started with just a group of men who, during this festival time, it was the harvest, and they would stomp in a circle. And they that would um, was the threshing floor where the wheat would be separated. And they would sing as they worked, sort of the way many of us might think of um, slaves singing their slave songs to keep in time in um, you know the cotton fields. These men were singing as they stomped. And it got uh, had a spiritual purpose. They're praying for the harvest. They're praying that the food is edible. They're praying uh, for continued blessings. And so that evolved into a spectacle where people would come watch. And then eventually um, someone stepped out of the chorus of people who were stomping in that circle. 
um, and his name was Thespis, which is where we get the word thespian. Uh, you may have heard that before. But, uh, and so then it evolved into this for ancient Greece. And uh, in ancient Rome, um, theater changed a lot. It started to have a more comic side. And you can see these edifice here with lots of ornate, it's kind of withered away now, uh, but it's taller. So the Romans sort of developed it some too. And now we'll jump a couple hundred years into, or 1600 years, whatever, uh, into Elizabethan theater, which is when Shakespeare was performed in the Globe. We'll talk about that a little bit more today. But you can see that they were outdoor theaters. It's a wooden O. Right across from the Globe was the Rose, which was Christopher Marlowe's theater. So it wasn't anything specific to Shakespeare himself. But these were outdoor theaters. The sunlight was the lighting, and they were these wooden O's. So if you said in uh, Elizabeth in England, I'm going to go to the theater, that's what the theater looked like. This is probably if you've ever been to the Tennessee Performing Arts Center or uh, even your high school auditorium. Mm, it's probably going to sort of visually similar to the Opera House. It has what's called a proscenium arch down at the Motlow Main Campus. We have a typical opera house style with the proscenium arch. That's that picture frame looking uh, thing around the front edifice of the stage. Um, and uh, you can see the curtains and that sort of uh, technology, if you want to call it that, is what we think of today as an opera house, which is by far the most common form of theater that you might go visit. So theater is a building, whether it be an outdoor building, whether it be an ancient building, or this modern opera house. Theater, besides just being a building, is also a group of people. A group of people. So your English teacher probably told you how brilliant Shakespeare was, um, and he was, I tend to agree with that, but part of what made Shakespeare so brilliant is all of the people that he worked with. You think about how quickly they learned their lines, how talented they were, they were celebrities in their time. So if we look at a character like uh, William Kemp, he was a clown, and he could um, sing really well. But Robert Armin, who was a different clown after William Kemp retired, Robert Armin was a dancer. So Shakespeare in his plays, you can see his clowns used to sing and then up to a point and then they switched to having little dance breaks. So we can see that Shakespeare wrote for the people who were performing his plays and Shakespeare was not alone in this. Um, Moliere wrote for the actors who performed for him. So he drew on the talents that the people in his company had. The same person who played Othello then also played Hamlet. And, and that actor, R Richard Burbage, had a real deep sensibility, an ability to philosophize and um, say things eloquently. So theater, just as much as a playwright, it's also those actors, and the actors contribute to the play script, and they make up um, part of the theater. So the touring company, it's not just a place. Uh, you know, I can perform theater uh, where I work also in Motlow, Smyrna, because we could go do a play on the lawn. We don't need a building to do a play, and uh, Lord Chamberlain meant Chamberlain's Men, which was Shakespeare's theater company, went and performed for the Queen. They went and performed um, for Queen Elizabeth. They, we have evidence that he also, uh, after Queen Elizabeth passed on, um, he did Jacobean theater. He performed for um, King James, which is where we get the King James Bible. So you don't ha necessarily have to have a place. Theater is just as much a group or company or troupe. The, your documentary like to use the word ensemble. Right, and you'll notice that the playwrights live there also at the theater, and they also bounce ideas off the actors while they're writing their plays. Uh, if you've uh, we, they didn't really go into that much, but you can look on their website and see that they have uh, three playwrights in residence right now as I'm recording this. 
So um, actors become part of the creative process of creating a script too, so it's pretty exciting, but I digress. Um, so Second City, this is a um, improvisation troupe, an acting touring company that's still going on today. They're based out of Chicago, but um, I saw them when I lived down in Mississippi, and they tour the country. So you can see some of those big um, faces, Tim Meadows uh, from the Saturday Night Live, uh, Mike Myers. So those actors were part of these improvisation troops and they didn't even need a script. They just needed actors and a um, audience. And that's really the essence of theater is just actors and an audience. So they are part of the touring company. So turning over to page 11, just plowing through here, you can see some of the people who you might meet if you go to a theater. The first one I want to look at is the director. We'll skip over producer for now, but we'll come back to it, trust me. Um, the director is sort of the coach. Uh, if we're, We'll get to a sports analogy in a minute, but they're sort of the person who makes sure everybody's on the same page, uh, asks and uh, continues to motivate uh, everyone involved. Jackie Maxwell is not only the director, she's the artistic director, which means that she is over everything creative. Uh, so if you go to the Nashville Shakespeare, you might meet Denise Hicks. She is the artistic director of the Nashville Shakespeare Company. Um, and so uh, it's not uncommon. She also, Denise Hicks, is a director. Sometimes she acts, but most of the time she's a director. So it's not uncommon for someone to be a director of just the play and then also a director of the entire artistic community because they have those administrative skills, the skills to lead. And that's what Jackie Maxwell has. And you could see her as she kind of talks to the actors and gives them feedback and pushes them, guides them in a certain direction. We also met uh, Moya O'Connell, who was playing Hedda Gabler, um, and you saw the way that she emoted and memorized her lines, and I think you're pretty familiar with the concept of an actor there. <laughs> um, William Schmuck, what a unfortunate name. Uh, for Hedda Gabler, he designed this beautiful set, and he also designed the costumes, and it's a pretty small play. Um, but you can see all of those rich textures. The designer comes up with the initial concept. They um, map out, they make a rendering. Uh, for, in this case, we saw the person building the model had gotten um, a blueprint, basically, a draft uh, from Mr. Schmuck, and then created a model from it, and then the set was built from there. So it goes from the designer's hands into the builder's hands. And there are all sorts of builders. This was the prop guy who took us around their fantastic warehouse. I really wish we had a warehouse like that for Motlo. We have like a few rooms. Um, they're cram packed full of wonderful things, but I am still very jealous of their big, huge warehouse. Uh, I think I would probably be in heaven if I was there. Uh, but uh, Wayne w went, showed us around and showed us the furniture and the telephones there you can see. So he pulls different items to go on the stage. But then we also have the artists and we have the people who are painting and molding and uh, creating. Those are craftspeople, definite artists. Um, and it happens through the things we can physically touch, but then it also happens through sound effects, through lighting effects. So um, the builders, they have the, from the time they get the script until opening night to sort of create their masterpiece. And then we have the crew. Now you may notice this is the actors again, uh, because the crew is not pictured. The crew is backstage, they have on headsets, they are often pushing buttons to make things go. Now Peter Gracie uh, had a short, very short segment where he talked about how he got blood to um, pneumatically uh, poof and uh, all of behind that screen right there he poured the blood in and then when he heard the verbal cue he's the one who pressed the button and made the gunshot effect. So he is the crew. He runs the show after it opens. He uh, pushes the button at the right time. So the person back at the light board or sound board who's pressing buttons for transitions, the uh, seamstress who's in the uh, 
backstage area who's changing people's clothes in order for, to get that quick change. Remember we met that act, the uh, woman who said uh, we only have a minute to change her pantyhose and her dress and all of that. She would be considered a crew member. Um, shifting scenery or shifting props, those would be considered crew members, but a good crew member uh, is invisible. So. Peter Gracie, I'm sorry, but you're not pictured. They usually have to wear all black and have a headset so that they can communicate with other crew members backstage. So, um, so moving on to page 12, I'm going to skip over stage managing and house managing. Uh, we'll get to that when we get to an in-depth look at technical theater, but I'm just kind of just giving you a broad sweep today. Uh, and it's also worth saying before I move on to the similarities of sports, it's not uncommon for um, a person to have multiple skills. So I uh, was an actress at the same time that I was costuming and in a small theater particularly you have to be able to do it all. Um, backstage Badger <laughs> says, you know, oh, what is this? what did I do for the play? What was it? you know is it what is actually listed in the program or do you want to know what I actually did for the play and especially in small theater companies we end up doing lots of things uh, if you were to take the production class at the main campus you would probably act in the play as well as paint the set as well as pull some props uh, we all pitch in together so anyway moving on to the bottom of page 12 um, theater in its essence is playing uh, you can see there in French and German and English, it all, um, theater rhetoric is similar uh, to game rhetoric, to play. Um, and theater is playful at its essence. In the original ancient Greece, uh, that Dionysian theater that I showed you was also where the Olympic Games were held. Um, and, you know, they would come to see a play one day, and then the next day they would come to see uh, the Olympic Games. So, um, in our culture, the most highly paid um, people are professional athletes and stage entertainers. So, they're still in their essence very similar to... Um, each other and we'll come back to that as a theme in the class. So theater is play also in the way that it's kind of childish and we see this instinct to tell stories. We see this instinct to play. This is my nephew uh, Samson as uh, Captain America obviously and that is his friend Toby as a mix between Thor and Charlie Brown. Interesting choice. Um, <laughs> but children like to put on costumes and act out the stories that they hear. Uh, they take it beyond just storytelling. Um, but it also can come from a very dark place. He points out rightly, when children play hide and seek, they're actually psychologically working through something that's a very real fear of theirs, which may be abandonment. Um, you may have what G.K. Chesterton would call a dangerous imagination. You may act out these things in your heads, uh, in scenarios of the worst possible scenarios. And when we write these deep and um, painful dramas, people ask, why would you want to go see that? Well, in a way, you know, we watch Outbreak because we want to think about what happens if the world ends or we have these horrible endemics. Uh, it helps us to sort of psychologically sort through that and we'll come um, back to that idea of deep psychological need for storytelling uh, later in the class. Um, so theater is people, theater is a building, theater is instinctual, theater is play, theater is also art. It is soul food. If you've ever had a bad day and you put on a good piece of music and it just perks you up and changes your day and makes you feel better, um, to me theater is good theater I should say, it's just like a good song, is soul food. It's elegant, it's well crafted, it takes skill. Uh, one of my favorite things about Wicked is just watching the chorus dancers. It doesn't even have to be Adina Menzel um, you know, belting at the top of her lungs, although that is definitely soul food for me as well. Just watching these dancers, uh, you know, do their thing and uh, it's just beautiful and we need that beauty. 
we need uh, soul food uh, just to revive our spirits. I will um, skip lunch so that I can go see the play if I was broke in grad school um, because I needed to see a good play more than I needed to eat sometimes. Uh, because beauty is refreshing and beauty speaks to us on a deep level. Um, so just like any of the other art forms that you could have taken in this class, theater is an art. Uh, theater is impersonation. It is an actor pretending to be someone that they're not. And this can be something kind of tricky is um, where does the actor begin and the uh, character end and and that can be sort of a tricky question for us in the modern age there can be sort of a blurred line um, Christian Bale to me is not Batman he's you know the character from the Newsies because I grew up watching that musical but uh, you may think of Batman as one of these other um, actors for me it's Michael Keaton I love that Tim Burton Batman um, that's who I think of as my Batman for my generation but a mask was something they used in ancient Greece to have a clear separation between an actor and a character. A clear separation. So you never saw a human face, you always saw a mask. And that mask also had a um, amplifier in the mouth so that they could speak louder, which is handy. But when they put on that mask in ancient Greece, remember this was a religious festival for them, and they would go through an entire religious um, experience thinking that when they put on the mask, the character sort of inhabited them. So once again, we get into this tricky psychological area. You may know someone with um, schizophrenia or multiple personalities that's putting on different personas. Uh, another horrible example uh, is Heath Ledger. When he was playing the Joker is when he overdosed. Uh, and many people sort of blame the method acting approach of getting too close to that character and getting burned. If you're playing someone evil, uh, how much do you indulge that or is it too hard for us psychologically to see the difference between the character we're playing and the actor we're playing. So theater as, at its essence is also impersonating a character. If you're telling a story and you start to act like the person who you're telling, well you're doing little mini theater there. You're putting on the mask, but the mask continues to be a representation for what happens in theater, of putting on a character. Now, ancient forms of theater in all different kind of cultures, which probably had very limited access to each other, um, the mask exists. Uh, so for no theater in the Japan, um, this is a also a religious ritual and you can see that there are humans being act out but there's also demons and spirits and um, the no theater in Japan is very slow and uh, very meditative. If you went to go see no theater you'd probably be surprised that it's called theater but there's an audience and it's interesting that this same instinct to put on a mask and act out a character occurred for the Japanese as well as the Grecians around the same time. Um, Commedia dell'arte! So the Italians also put on these masks. So after Rome fell, um, we have the Italians picking back up that same tradition and acting in the streets. And the they may have lost the big huge facades and big huge theaters, but they didn't let go of that mask because the mask was um, the essence of theater to the Italians, uh, former Greeks. So, um, masks are important and they symbolize an actor putting on a character. So, in order to do theater, we need a building, we need a company of actors, we need impersonators, uh, it's art, it's work, it's um, uh, at its essence though, it's a performer and an audience. So theater is a performance. It's a relationship between a performer and an audience. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. So 
We have audiences in our everyday life. Right now, I'm the performer and you're the audience member. Uh, It's nothing that is strictly in the theater. Uh, You may have gotten in a fight and there were people watching. You may have been in a jury and you were the audience member there. Or maybe you've played games (laughs) in your own relationships and you've sort of put on a persona um, with someone, such as giving someone the silent treatment. That's a very intentional performance that you're making to make a point. So we have audiences in our everyday life. Now, you can have different relationships with an audience. If you go to see some stand-up, they're going to look right into your eyes as uh, performers, and they're going to haggle you. They might comment on your outfit or ask you if that's your wife. Uh, Ferris Bueller famously looked into the camera there and said, they bought it, right? That was a presentational moment. Presentation uh, just means that you're directly and continuously acknowledging the audience as a performer that eye contact. So one of the famous places this happens is in the Globe. That's me there in London in the Globe Theatre, which is where Shakespeare uh, performed. Now this is a rebuilt version of the Globe. The Globe burned many, many times. This is just a, um, a, you know, based on the same ground plan, a recreation. There's the word I was looking for of the Globe. Um, In the Globe, Shakespeare's actors often had soliloquies or asides where they talk directly to the audience. So you can see that guy in 17th century costume there talking to people in modern clothes, right? He may be telling them um, to be or not to be. That is the question. Uh, He's taking a moment to look directly at the audience, and that is called uh, presentationalism, right? That presentational style, that presentational relationship with the audience. That's, uh, I'm behind the camera there. We got to stand right there at the foot of the stage for study abroad. It was so fun to be right in the middle. And uh, it's more fun than a regular play because they look directly at you. You're involved in the story. And I'm seeing this more and more um, with shows like The Blue Man Group, right? They pull audience members up on stage and, uh, it kind of breaks down and it's one thing as the theater that you have an advantage over film is kind of directly addressing the audience but there are also moments in Midsummer Night's Dream here you can see where they're talking amongst themselves and you're just watching this is the most common and fundamental uh, mode of theater is representation and we're on page 16 uh, when we're just watching as they're acting out the story they're not looking at us they're not direct directly addressing us they're just talking amongst themselves right and we as audience members if they don't look at us directly it's easier for us to kind of fall in and believe the story that they're telling right Uh, we are more likely to empathize and believe what they're saying kids are wonderful at being able to um, as Coolidge said suspend their disbelief to let go of Um, any sense of what's really happening and let themselves live in the story a really good play you forget that you're watching a play you feel like you're there in the action and children more naturally do this when they play right my little nephew when he says I am Captain America and I say why yes of course you are and you can fly let's go you know Uh, we actively suspend our disbelief and let ourselves believe in the magic and get caught up in the motion emotion. So when you go to see a live play, I want to challenge you to try to be childlike. Try to expose yourself to the wonder of theater and let yourself go there. Um, A great example of this in Midsummer is when Oberon says, I am invisible and I will overhear their conference and then he snaps his fingers, right? And Shakespeare's audience you know, then Oberon is walking throughout the scene and the other actors don't see him or pretend not to see him. And he's listening to what they're saying. And all it took for Shakespeare is to announce 
just like my nephew did, I am Captain America. <laughs> uh, you know, in Midsummer, Oberon says, I am invisible. Snap. Now, he didn't have CGI. He didn't have a green screen to create a sense of invisibility. He uh, just announced it, and it was so because his audience was willing to suspend their disbelief. So some theaters' experiences that you go to will be more realistic, and you won't have as much trouble suspending your disbelief. And then other times, you're at, you're author will outright ask you to suspend your disbelief right by announcing that he is invisible so um, it is a fair comparison what is uh, theater it's very similar to film a lot of the theater productions have been turned into film a lot of stage actors then go on to do film or if in some cases the um, actors in film go back and do uh, theater because many of them really enjoy it. Um, you can see here Daniel Radcliffe's quote on page 19. I love the stage. I love being on stage, the rush and the fear and all that, right? Because if you're being filmed, you can do another take. If I mess up while I'm recording this lecture, I can re-record the lecture, although I'll probably just leave the mistakes then. Um, but on the stage, you don't have a chance to re-record. It's live. It's in the moment, which can be sort of the best thing about theater is that it's a happening and the immediacy, the presentness of it. But it can also sort of be the worst thing. So I know you just met me, but I'm going to tell you about one of the worst days of my life. Um, I was a professional actor at a repertory theater, uh, very similar to um, the theater you watched the documentary about. We were doing uh, three shows. I was in two of those shows acting at the same time. It was a very rigorous schedule. I was also working in the costume shop. That's me in the purple dress there. I was playing Luella Parsons and um, this particular day I was supposed to come out on stage and I start the show with a two-page monologue and when I walked out on stage the lights in the house over the audience did not go out and it was mortifying for me I couldn't remember my lines I was standing there alone on stage nobody to help me and I couldn't remember my lines uh, we call this an actor's nightmare except mine was while I was awake and I was so embarrassed uh, and I'd already done the show a dozen times and I was gonna have to do the show a dozen more times um, and it was really hard uh, after about five minutes of standing there staring at them blankly I kind of picked up halfway through the monologue and um, and left the stage it was very embarrassing and I just admit that to say that uh, theater is a happening and sometimes it happens right and sometimes it doesn't <laughs> and it can be very embarrassing and out of the hundreds of performances that I've had I'll never forget this one so um, nice to meet you and that was one of the worst days of my life so uh, theater is a happening and sometimes it doesn't happen right and if you're in the audience uh, I want you to reflect on that did you notice that anything went wrong was somebody supposed to have um, a hat they have a reference to their hat and they're not wearing their hat well that quick change didn't happen right uh, and that's part of the excitement of theater for you as an audience member is that sometimes uh, it fails gloriously and you get to watch and it's part of the risk for us as performers is that the show must go on so it's funny when I read these reflections uh, that I write, ask you to write so many times you reflect on something that's going on in the audience and I think that's interesting because just as much uh, theater performance is about what's happening on stage um, but a theater is also about what's happening in the audience because you become part of the performance. If you laugh at the jokes, the actor has to pause for that. The actor engages that differently than if you were just watching a movie. The movie is something static. It's something um, not fluid. It's, it's not going to change. Whereas the house light's not coming up and the audience staring at me blankly, right, they are part of that experience as much as I am, which is part of the reason it's so mortifying. And there are different theaters have different personalities. If you go to the Apollo, um, it's not uncommon for you to get booed off stage, right? Uh, a historically African-American uh, theater and they have no mercy when it comes to an act they're not enjoying, right? Very famous performers have been booed off the stage and failed gloriously at the Apollo. 
So, like I said, part of the fun of going to the theater is the community that you build with other audience members. Um, and we get this to a certain extent with film. and People dress up uh, and go to opening night, late night performance. Um, theaters have been historically very dangerous places to be. You can see a booth there. If you don't know, Abraham Lincoln was shot in the theater. Theaters burned often, but people still risked it because it was a social event. It was a way to make yourself present in the community and um, to enjoy something. Uh, it was a very high society thing to do in some cultures and in other cultures it was what everybody did. So um, we'll look at those different cultures. So lastly, so we've talked about theater as a building, a company, as art, as impersonation, as performance, as feelings and psychology, but a theater uh, may also refer to the script itself. If you say, I've got a play, you may be talking about a play script that the playwright wrote, right? Uh, it's something that's written and then rehearsed often that happens for months and months and months. Now there may be some ad-libbing in there, especially if you're like me and you forget your lines um, at the beginning of the show there. Uh, but uh, in general, it's a written text by a genius playwright who then, that is a blueprint for us to then build on and create and act out this play. So if you go to see um, one person's performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream. You may see fairy wings and glitter and sparkles, but if you go to another performance of Midsummer Night's Dream, like I did at the Globe, it may be mud and animal skins. So different, the play is the same, the play script is the same, but different theaters, different personalities bring their ensemble and bring it to life in different ways. So a play is part of the thing, but it's not the whole thing. So, and we'll begin next class with the idea of what is a play, because it deserves its own lecture. But I just want to remind you that um, you're required not only to get this um, textbook, but also to get this play script. While we're talking about play scripts, Joe Turner's Come and Gone by August Wilson. So, I introduced you to several sides of the theater today, the building, the companies, um, historical theater, uh, theater as a script, theater as something that we instinctually do, as a relationship between actor and audience, as a relationship between an actor and a character. So, I hope you've been following along and you're ready to take that 10 question quiz. Um, as always, uh, I appreciate your attention. I'm sorry if this felt a little bit uh, rambling. The theater means so much to me and it's hard to encapsulize it. It's the people that I love. It's the lifestyle that I've lived. Uh, it's the event that I look forward to. It's the place that I've called home. And so if it feels a little bit schizophrenic today, uh, it's because the theater is hard to pin down. It's like pinning jello to a wall. So I hope to be a little more organized in the future, but thank you for listening.